Tony Daik. Tony is a Palestinian Christian from Bethlehem. He is a residential researcher at Tyndale House, Cambridge, where he is working on his PhD research in the New Testament. Tony is a lecturer in biblical studies at Bethlehem Bible College and a networking team member of the International Fellowship of Mission as Transformation. Please, let's all welcome Tony Daik. Good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. And a special thanks to my colleagues at the organizing committee for flying me in just to speak at this conference after so many years abroad in the diaspora. Thank you, Pastor Munder and Yusuf. <laughs> when my colleagues at the organizing committee invited me to speak, they gave me a rather provocative title to speak on. Let's see if this works. They gave me this title, basically, Unjust Structures, Individual Charity is Not Enough. Don't worry, I still plan to talk about this, but I decided to change the title a little bit to a perhaps less provocative one, Subversive Social Ethics, Charity and Justice in Earliest Christian Communities. This title will also allow me to focus more on my area of research that I've been spending most of my time on the New Testament and Christian origins. However, the, the original title of the talk reveals a sentiment that is not only widespread in Palestine, but that is shared among other subaltern groups, especially in the majority world. People who are usually at the receiving end of charity and aid. Recently, a pastor from the Dominican Republic who's also a top-notch Bible translator, the, the guy reads uh, through the Bible every year in the original languages. He told me how he felt outraged, even insulted, from a gift that he received from supporters from North America, to the degree that he wanted to send that gift back. The gift sadly came with an attitude which sees third world people, no matter their achievements or education, as perpetual pupils in continuous need to be educated, trained, and developed. In different parts of Africa and South America, in Bolivia, for example, in Kenya also, wealthy nations and corporations are imposing carbon offset projects on local indigenous communities in the name of development, the name of charity, aid, climate action. Plant a tree, right? To offset the carbon emission of your flight. It's a good thing but when it's done in your backyard. However, some of these trees get planted in Africa and South America as part of large-scale carbon offset projects without respecting the indigenous communities, their lands, or their agricultural practices. Even worse, some of these projects lead to land grab, expulsion of indigenous communities, and plantation practices that completely damage local biodiversity. For many of us, this is new forms of colonialism, neo-colonialism. Attitudes towards charity and aid are not very different in Palestine than Africa or Latin America. Palestinian civil society organizations frequently remark how charity and aid tend to hinder their work instead of advancing it. Donors usually come with agendas and priorities, and they impose them on the local community. And worse, charity and aid in Palestine often emphasize the status quo of the Israeli occupation, and help make Israeli policies more permanent. For, for example, roads and infrastructure projects that facilitate apartheid and segregation tend to receive considerable donations in the, in the name of philanthropy and aid. These projects, however, only contribute to making the Israeli occupation more permanent. However, however if you are a Christian listening to, to this, you might be saying, well, wait a minute. Isn't charity at the core of what, of what Christians are supposed to do? Didn't Jesus say, sell your, your possessions and give alms? I mean, in the Gospel of Luke, the, the Gospel of the poor and the marginalized, sell your possessions and give alms. Didn't he say, give alms and everything will be clean for you? Or as the, or as the NIV puts it, be generous to the poor 
and everything will be clean for you. Such a radical teaching. Well, charity and aid is indeed at the core of our Christian ethics. It is something we are commanded to do and are expected to do. But the main question is, what does this mean? Or more specifically, how did earliest Christian communities, the Church of the New Testament, understand and practice charity and almsgiving? Allow me to, to get a bit geeky and technical here just to deliver my point. So the word that the New Testament uses for almsgiving is elemesune. This word is closely associated with another word, eleos, which basically means compassion or mercy. That's the word that, you, that Jesus uses in Matthew 9 in his quotation from Hosea, from Hosea, where he says, I desire mercy, I desire eleos, not sacrifice. It's the same word that's also used to describe God's mercy and compassion towards us. His eleos, his mercy, is for those who fear him from generation to, to generation, Luke chapter 1. The word eleos is also connected with God's pure and sacrificial love, this much celebrated word, agape. Paul tells the church of Ephesus, but God, who is rich in mercy, in eleos, out of his great agape love, with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. Now, incidentally, this word agape, love, is the word that Jerome, the great Bible translator and church father who lived here and worked in, in, in Bethlehem, actually, just below what is now the Nativity Church in the fourth century. He translates agape frequently in the, in the Vulgate translation to caritas, which later on in the 14th century, John Wycliffe translates into the Middle English charite with an E, and then from which the modern English word charity comes from. I hope I'm not getting too, too technical here, but what I'm trying to say is quite straightforward. Almsgiving or charity is an expression of mercy, compassion, and sacrificial love, the kind of love that God loves us with. And that's the first thing that almsgiving, Elemesune, expresses. But that's not the full picture. The second thing that almsgiving expresses is justice. And this is rarely found in standard commentaries, surprisingly. Now, in order to understand this, it's important to understand the context of the New Testament a little bit. The notion of almsgiving finds its mature formulation in the theology and practice of God's people in the intertestamental period, or what is usually known roughly, it's, the, it, it's roughly equivalent to what is known as the, second, the period of Second Temple Judaism. In particular, we find spe special emphasis on almsgiving in the writings that are unfortunately not, not printed in our Protestant Bibles. They did through canonical writings or the, Old, or the Old Testament Apocrypha, especially the books of Tobit and Sirach. There, particularly in Tobit, almsgiving is repeatedly portrayed as doing justice. Doing justice. For, for, for example, Tobit 4, verses 6 to 7 reads, to all those who practice justice, give justice alms from your possessions. To all those who practice justice, give alms from your possessions. As clearly stated by prominent Roman Catholic scholar Luke Timothy Johnson, the sharing of possessions through almsgiving was an important expression of doing justice in Judaism. The close connection of justice with almsgiving or charity is also clear in the New Testament, in the text itself. For, for example, in Luke, Chapter 11, verse 42, Jesus tells the Pharisees, in a famous verse, but woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and herbs and all kinds, of all kinds, and neglect justice and the love of God. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. In other words, for Jesus, the kind of material giving that neglects God's justice and love is empty, is meaningless. Using Jesus' expression, woe to me, if I give without love and justice. Amen. So what I'm trying to say is this. For earliest Christian communities, charity or almsgiving is an expression of two things. First, it's an expression of compassion and love, the kind of pure and sacrificial love we see in God himself. And second, charity is an expression of justice. This means that when earliest Christians gave charity 
they were doing it in sacrificial love in order to set things right. For that is the basic meaning of justice in the ancient world, doing what is right and fair. Now, charity in itself was not the final goal or telos of, for early Christians. Rather, charity had a very important social and theological functions, I argue. Early Christians gave in order to establish a just and fair community that stands in stark contrast with the social ethics that were prevalent in the Roman Empire. More specifically, early Christians offered the Greco-Roman world an alternative, a new, a fresh model of social justice that runs counter to the prevalent ethics and socio-economic structures of the Roman Empire. The social and theological functions of charity are clear in the New Testament, especially in the writings of Paul and Luke. For, for example, in his exhortation to give to the Corinthians, Paul explains clearly that the aim of giving is equality and fairness within the community. The NIV has the best translation of that text in 2 Corinthians. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. The other New Testament author that I want to spend time with, who fleshes out the social and theological functions of charity, is Luke in the book of Acts. In his description of the life of the early church, in the early chapters of Acts, Luke says the following. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And then he repeats that description again in Acts 4. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, you, you will not be surprised if I tell you this is among the most controversial passages in the New Testament to interpret. And they have actually generated a huge amount of debate among biblical scholars in the last 45 years. I think 15 PhD theses were written about them. From those who see them at represent, as representing an ancient form of Christian communism, that prohibits private property, all the way to those who reduce their meaning to simply an exhortation to the wealthy to help the poor. And what adds to the complexity of interpreting these passages is that they are intertextually dense, which basically means that Luke infuses these passages with ideas and language from other texts that we need to immerse in the original culture of Luke and his reader in order to understand what he's talking about. In particular, these passages have three main ideas and the language, obviously, associated with them, which were widespread in Greco-Roman philosophical writings. The idea of unity within community, holding things in common, and not claiming private ownership. And what is very striking is that the main ideas here, holding everything in common and not claiming private ownership, do not exist in any biblical material but are widespread in philosophical, in philosophical writings, from Pythagoras to Plato to Aristotle and the Stoics. And the question is, what is Luke saying by using philosophical ideas, ideas of the world and language in his description of the life of the early church? What is he trying to teach Theophilus and his readers? Two main theories have been offered to interpret these passages. And the first theory says that Luke is using the language and ideas that are found in philosophical discussions about friendship. Okay? And the second proposes that Luke is alluding to the great Greco-Roman utopias. Philosophers since Pythagoras in the 6th century BC spoke about how among friends everything should be in common. And the great philosopher Plato described an ideal utopian republic where people will share possessions, at least among the ruling class. 
So according to these theories, Luke is telling Theophilus and the, the original reader that the early church is an ideal community that fulfills the wonderful friendship ideas and or the utopian visions of the great Greco-Roman philosophers and thinkers. Now, while some of Luke's original readers could have made such connections, these theories do not seem to capture the essence of what Luke is trying to say. In fact, one of the main issues with these theories is that they do not take the whole picture of what Luke is saying into consideration. The ideas of holding things in common, okay, and not claiming private ownership are abstract ideas. The question that needs to be asked is, what does Luke mean by holding things in common and not claiming private ownership? Now, Luke provides an answer to this question in the subsequent verses. This is the concrete answer. This is the, he's explaining here concretely what does holding things in common mean and what does uh, 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 not claiming private ownership mean. He says immediately, there was not a needy person among them. For as many as owned lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. So basically the ideas of holding things in common and not claiming private ownership concretely mean the redistribution of wealth in community to the end that no one is left in need. Now if we take these ideas and language together, the ideas of unity, holding things in common, not claiming private ownership, and wealth distribution, we'll find out that Luke isn't as much using the language of Greco-Roman friendship or utopia, but the language of social justice, or what the ancients called distributive justice. And these two terms actually are synonymous today. The more academic term is distributive justice, and the more popular one is social justice. You can check out the, the Oxford Handbook for Distributive Justice or Fleischacker's short history of distributive justice on that. Unfortunately, some today, even among scholars, surprisingly, think that social justice is a modern construct, is a modern phenomenon, mainly found among angry people, you know, like us Palestinians, calling for equity and calling for justice. However, the notion of social justice or distributive justice can be traced back to Pythagoras in the 6th century BC. Actually, it all comes from his triangle, the right-hand the right triangle. And it was none that the great philosopher Aristotle who first coined the term distributive justice. Aristotle, in fact, is still considered one of the main theorists of, of social justice until today. And what is fascinating is that ancient philosophers spoke about social justice using the same language and ideas that Luke chooses to use in his description of the life of the early church the language and ideas of holding things in common, unity, wealth distribution, and not claiming private ownership. For example, for, for Aristotle, the main question of social justice is the question of how things held in common, whether wealth, land, security, or whatever, can be distributed justly and fairly within a koinonia, a word that Luke uses often, which means community or fellowship. And similarly for Pythagoras, we are told through his ancient Syrian Arab biographer, Iamblichus of Chalcis, that the foundation principle of justice is indeed the common and equal and the nearest to being one body and one soul, for all to share the same experience and together to declare what is mine is also yours, banishing among customs everything private and increasing what is common up to the last possessions. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that the language and ideas that Luke uses in his description of the life of the early church are those of social justice or distributive justice. This is how the ancients defined social justice. This is how they thought about it. This is how they wrote about it. For them, social justice is the question of how a community should live together and distribute shared things among themselves fairly and equally, whether it's land, whether it's wealth, political rights, security, among others. And Luke is simply doing the same. He's tackling the basic question of social justice, but he's doing that not via philosophical argumentation, but through a historical narrative that is politically and philosophically charged. Luke, in fact, is doing much more than that. 
He's actually proposing a new model of social justice based on the lived ethics of the earliest Christian communities, which subverts Greco-Roman social ethics. The best way to understand this is through this illustration. It's a meme that has gone viral in the last several years. There is a lot of discussion around it and around this topic today, equality versus equity. And some define equality as giving people the exact equal measure of the same thing, one box to each. While equity is defined as giving people different shares in order to give them access to the same opportunities. Now, the ancients had a similar discussion, but they used different terminology. Greco-Roman philosophers, for, for example, Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle, talked about arithmetic equality, katarithmon, versus geometric or proportional equality, isotes geometrike. They defined arithmetic equality as basically giving people the exact same share, one box to each, whereas proportional equality for them meant distributing different measures to different people according to a certain merit. Now, while the philosophers debated the details of this criterion, they all agreed that proportional equality ought to be based upon the person's merit or their nature. And you find this consistently from Pythagoras to the Stoics of the first century. Distributive, the best distributive justice, they argued consistently, should be based on the person's merit or nature. That is, the more the worth of the person or the higher their nature, the more they get. Or in other words, to everyone, each according to their merit or worth. And many options were discussed in the ancient world for how to measure a person's worth, including wealth. Plato entertained it in, in, entertained it in, its, in, in his laws. The more you own, you, the more you receive in distribution. Social uh, uh, status, family background, virtue, education, these are considered among, these were considered among the, the measurements upon which this criterion of distributive justice should be based. So if we want to illustrate the notion of proportionate equality in the ancient world, it would be something like this. Looks familiar, right? <laughs> so let's suppose that a worth, the worth is measured by height by how tall someone is, which is actually not far-fetched in the ancient world. Plato entertained physical strength, the warrior culture, as a criterion. Now, let's suppose that the first guy is two meters, and the second one, and the third, half a meter. In order to achieve proportional equality, we need to give the highest guy, who has already more, who's worth more, who's taller, in proportion to, his, to, his, uh, to how tall he is. So if we give the guy, that, that's two meter height, two boxes. We need to give the guy in the middle that's one meter height, one box, and the little one, half a box. This is, for the ancients, is the beauty of distributive justice. As Aristotle said, equality is the equality of ratios. And the idea behind it, as you can probably see, is not to create equity or social welfare. These are laughable ideas in the ancient world. It's laughable to create a, a social welfare society in the ancient world where the weak and less have the same opportunities as the strong and more able members of the society. The idea behind this distributive justice is to maintain harmony and peace within society by rendering to each according to their merit. Or as nicely put by Plato, justice consists of granting the equality that unequals deserve to get. This is the social ethic that was underpinning the world that Luke and the early Christian movement lived in. And this is the social ethic that Luke was alluding to in his description of the church's way of life. But Luke was alluding to subvert. That is, Luke used the language of Greco-Roman social justice to turn ancient conceptualizations of social justice upside down. And we can see this in several ways, but let me just highlight the two important ones. First, while early Christians, while early Christian social justice was based on proportional equality and not arithmetic, the Christian model differed radically from the Greco-Roman one 
in the criteria of distribution. Early Christians did not distinguish between people based on their worth, merit, or nature. They didn't treat people differently based on their social status, wealth, family background, or even education or virtue. Christians saw all people as fundamentally equal in two specific ways. First, they saw that all people are made in the image of God. This is how Paul, for example, describes pagan Athenians, non-Christians in Acts 17, as offspring of God, genos tu theou. And secondly, early Christians believed that all people distorted God's image through sin, including Christians themselves. This way of understanding humanity, this Christian anthropology, if you would like, did not allow early Christians to show favoritism or to categorize people based on merit or nature. For this reason, early Christians practiced a radical form of social justice that was unknown in the ancient world, in the Greek-Roman world. This radical form of social justice only distinguished between people only on the basis of their need. In other words, early Christians privileged the weaker members of the society, the poor, the needy, and the marginalized. Those who, whose needs are greater received more. Second, Christian social justice differed radically from its Greek Roman counterpart in the telos or goal of social justice. The philosophers based their social justice model on merit in order to avoid strife and conflict in the community. Everyone is, is given what they deserve, so everyone is happy. However, the telos or vision of Christian social justice is very different. The goal is to bridge the social economic divide and bring people to greater degrees of equality by creating, if you like, a, a welfare community that prioritizes and privileges the weak, the poor, and the marginalized. This vision is clear in Luke's description of the life of the early church, the passages that we read. There was not a needy person among them, which actually echoes the vision that God gave his people Israel that we read about in Deuteronomy 15, for example. There will be no one in need among you, Deuteronomy 15, 4. So what does this all mean to us today? The main question of the conference is, am I my neighbor's keeper? And I think this is more of a rhetorical question. Yusuf yesterday gave us a very good in introduction on, on this question. But I think it's still a rhetorical question, at least for us as Christians. Not because no answer is expected, but because the answer is so obvious and clear. Yes, of course, we are our neighbor's keepers. And in fact, what we have been doing so far in the conference is discussing what this entails. What does it mean to be my neighbor's keeper? And what I try to do briefly here is to bring an answer to this question from some of the earliest Christian texts and practices from the New Testament. And the answer revolves around two matters, charity and justice. For earliest Christians, these are two sides of the same coin and they should be so for us today. We as a church and as individual believers are called to stand with and keep our neighbor by engaging in acts of charity, of almsgiving, but not the kind of charity that embodies the values of the world around us, the kind of charity that patronizes and at times propagates injustice. The charity we're called to live and practice is the charity that embodies God's sacrificial love towards us and God's pure justice and righteousness. This, that's the essence of Christian charity. As a church, we're also called to tackle issues of structural injustice through action, activism, and also intellectual work. As evangelicals, we're often taught not to interfere in politics. We're told that we'd be better off if we focus our attention on spiritual things and leave politics to the politicians. However, this idea is far removed from the culture, thinking, and practice of the earliest Christians. Luke, for, for, for example, did not only interfere in politics. He used language and engaged with concepts that are at the core of the political and moral philosophy of his day. Discussions around distributive justice, for, for example, Aristotle, are framed as discussions on politique episteme, political knowledge, political science. Luke, therefore, rep represents for us a model of a Christian intellectual, a public theologian, if you would like, who does not shy away from the pressing concerns and questions of his society, 
but deeply engages with them. Nevertheless, Luke's engagement with social political affairs, as in the case of the first century Christian movement, does not come from the center of power, but, but from the margins. It doesn't come from above, it comes from below. Although early Christians proclaimed Jesus as curious, Lord, in direct defiance of the Roman Empire, they did not aim to establish a theocracy or a Christian empire like some Christians sadly aspire today. Rather, early Christians offered the wider society through their lived ethics and writings an alternative way of being and living that challenges and subverts unjust social structures in the Roman Empire. Unjust structures that were justified and defended, actually, by some of the top think tanks of the ancient world. How courageous of Luke to write the way he wrote. Today, we no longer live in the Greek Roman world, obviously, but empires and unjust social, political, and economic structures remain. In Palestine, we experience this primarily in the brutal policies of the Israeli occupation, policies that facilitate land grab expansion of settlements, and the violation of the basic political and human rights of the Palestinians. But unjust structures aren't limited to Palestine, I try to keep reminding myself. I think of all the suffering and pain that other subaltern communities have been going through, both in the global north and the global south. Whether through the aggressive proliferation of neoliberal capitalism, or the rise of far-right ideologies, or due to misogyny, racism, or new forms of colonialism and new imperialism. I think of the suffering of our African-American sisters and brothers, the pain of the poor and the marginalized in the slums of Manila and the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, the violence against women, the daily violence against women worldwide, and the injustices committed against indigenous peoples of Africa, Pacifica, North, Central, and South America. I think it's a grave error to say that evangelicals have been oblivious to issues of social justice. Evangelical theologians from the global south and north have been stressing the importance of social justice. It is not new, a new thing. We're not the only people that speak about social justice. I, I think of the work of Latin American theologians, Rene Padilla and Samuel Escobar, the great African theologian, Kwame Bidiako, the Canadian the the theologian, Ron Sider, I think of important movements like the International Fellowship for Mission as Transformation, the MICA Network, Christians for Social Action, and this very conference, Christ at the Checkpoint, among many others. All this is definitely a cause for praise and joy, but the work is not done yet. We need to keep up the work and strengthen it. We who proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior and hold to the authority of scriptures need to encourage one another to follow in the footsteps of our Lord and the footsteps of his earliest disciples by living and embodying God's radical ethics, Jesus' radical ethics, and proclaiming them loud and clear in the face of injustice and oppression. We need to keep working for and proclaiming a biblical social justice that does not favor the strong and the wealthy and the privileged, but that prioritizes the weak and the marginalized. The New Testament reminds us that Christian social justice is a world upside down. It privileges the poor and the oppressed, gives more to those who have, left, who, who, who have less, and lifts up the weak, and centers those who are at the periphery. That's the essence of the Christian gospel, which we are called to emulate and live. Thank you.